Today we're talking social entrepreneurship, military families in Charlotte, and St. Patty's Day. I'm Carlton Hargrove, and this is 282. Hello, folks. Thank you for joining us for another great episode of 282. As usual, we've got a great discussion coming your way, and we've got a great group of people to talk about these hot topics. But before you meet them, we're going to say what's up to 2A2 producer Jarvis Holiday, who's over in what I'm calling today Mount Killerman Jarvis. <laughs> what's up, Jarvis? I like that one. You like that? I think okay. that's the best one yet. Thank you. All right. I um, want to let you guys know you can follow the show on Twitter at 282TV. If you like what you see, you want to make some comments, tweet us using hashtag 282TV. And a special shout out to our viewers on the live stream right now. Yes, what's up, live stream people? I hope you're enjoying all this wonderful activity. Uh, we're going to introduce everybody now. Um, starting on the end, we've got Charles Thomas, who's the executive director of Queen City Forward. Thank you. What's up, Charles? What's up? Up next, we've got uh, General Tom Waskow, retired U.S. Air Force. Thank you. And we've got Brittany Kaysen, who is the co-host of The Otis Show and also the new columnist at Charlotte Observer for the Paid to Party column. You got that right. And you're on 95.1, right? Kiss 95.1. Kiss 95.1. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I appreciate you coming by. Um, we're going to start the conversation off today talking about social entrepreneurship. Now, it's that's like kind of the catchword of mm -hmm. 2012, it seems. Everybody's talking about social entrepreneurship. And it's kind of sweeping the country, and it's come to Charlotte via your organization, as well as others, I'm sure. Right. And I want to I want to talk about that, but first I want to just have you tell people at home what is what is social entrepreneurship? Right. Yeah, um, that's a great question, Carlton, and it's a it's a good question to answer. Uh, a social entrepreneur or social entrepreneurship are individuals or organizations that are dedicated to having a positive social impact, but they use business models and business principles to. Um, move forward what they're doing economically as well as socially. Okay. So a good example that I always use of a social enterprise is Goodwill Industries. Oh, okay. Or a good example of a social entrepreneur here in Charlotte is Molly Barker, who's founded Girls on the Run. Yeah. Or King's right. Kitchen, which is a nonprofit right. restaurant. So it's a restaurant using business principles to feed the, the, the homeless and the hungry and to give people opportunities to work. Okay. So um, a social entrepreneur, interestingly enough, can be a for-profit or non-profit organization okay. yeah. dedicated to having a positive social impact. Like Tom's? Like Tom's okay. Shoes right. or, or a Ben & Jerry's um, yeah. um, being very positive, socially focused. And what my organization does, Queen City Forward, is we look, we're looking for the next generation of social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. We're looking to help those social entrepreneurs that need to be connected to resources and the relationships to grow their business. Because just like a typical entrepreneur, most entrepreneurs are working in isolation, alone in their home. And so when, what Queen City Forward is able to do is to offer things such as office space, okay. uh, connections to mentors and to talent such as interns, and then ultimately helping them get connected to capital and making sure they're ready for that, that growth. Okay. And, and we're looking to help them to grow up. Okay. One thing I'm wondering, is it a, a, a big difference between giving – assistance to somebody who is a social entrepreneur as opposed to an entrepreneur? Well, the challenges that each face are, are similar, you know, because entrepreneurs, again, like I said, usually they're working alone in a vacuum okay. by themselves. Each of them needs, uh, can gain from having a community where they can leverage one another. Mm -hmm. And so what Queen City Forward does is we put uh, social entrepreneurs together so that they can work with each other. Okay. Now, some of the challenges that a social entrepreneur that may face that's different than a typical entrepreneur is when it comes to funding. Okay. Because most investors are interested, typically venture capitalist investors, are interested in a return on their investment. Mm -hmm. And that could be a financial return. Whereas social entrepreneurs may be able to give a bit of a financial return, but their focus is on having a positive social impact. Right. So then you're getting into a new way of thinking about investing in social entrepreneurs. When we think about nonprofits, we think about grants, um, government assistance. Mm -hmm. um, when we think of... Um, for profits, we think of you know venture capital. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also a new term called venture philanthropy, hmm. where you have your donors that are pooling their money together and strategically giving it to organizations or enterprises to help them to grow. And they're doing it in a philanthropic way, but they're also doing it in a strategic way where they may be sitting on the board of that organization, mm -hmm. um, or they may, may hold that organization a little more accountable with their dollars and making sure that they're having the impact 
that the venture philanthropist, the investor, the donor is seeking to have with that organization. Okay. So you're right. It's a, it's a whole new movement that's you know going across the country, the world, and we're excited to, to be that voice here in Charlotte, um, excited to, to stimulate social entrepreneurs in our community to help uh, to, to solve some of our challenging, some of the challenging issues we face. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I want to ask you, and then I want to kind of pass it around a little bit, is what are ways that people can, can get involved with these organizations? I mean, besides patronizing them, um, what are some other ways that people can help out? That's a great question. Um, <clears throat> one of the, the main ways they can do that is, is by being a mentor these, to these organizations. So if you're working in one of these larger corporations and you have some business skills, mm -hmm. you could connect with Queen City Forward and we could connect you to a social enterprise that's looking to grow their business and that's looking for um, some business skills and business knowledge. So okay. whether it's in marketing, or business development, financial projections. Uh, so one of the ways you can help out is becoming a part of our resource directory, and we can connect you to the right social entrepreneurs. Okay. Uh, and then, of course, you can also um, you know, become an investor in a mm -hmm. social entrepreneur and think about how you can invest in a venture philanthropic way versus a uh, venture capital way. How can you not only put in your time and your service and expertise, but how can you strategically place your dollars? So there's also different organizations in town, like a Social Venture Partners, which is a venture philanthropy organization that folks can join as well. Okay. Well, General, I, I kind of want to ask you a question. Do you, Are you more apt to support a business if you know it is a social entrepreneur-oriented type business oh, like King's Kitchen? Yeah. In fact, uh, while we were waiting to come on, uh, Charles and I had a long discussion about uh, some of the initiatives that uh, – that uh, he and his company are taking to uh, take care of veterans as they return from uh, military okay. service. And, in fact, uh, I've already got his business card. All right. I'm going to mm -hmm. try and hook him up with uh, some of the contacts I have in order to uh, take care of these great young men and women as they come out of the uh, active duty military. That's cool. What about you, Brittany? Do you uh, find yourself, you know, patronizing businesses that do have a social impact? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm more prone to not only like frequent it as a consumer, but also promote it and talk about it mm -hmm. with my voice in the media. Because mm -hmm. the only point of having a voice is to speak up for others. And I think the only point of having a platform in a business is to help others too. So right. I think it's great what y'all are doing. So thank you. Yes. Well, Charles, I want to bring it back around and ask you, um, why do you think now all of a sudden that it is such an explosion of this type of enterprise? Well, I think um, Brittany mentioned it. It's this whole idea of shared value, um, mm -hmm. where we're looking for our companies, for-profit, non-profit, to, to create shared value for the community as well as for the shareholders, the, the business investors. Right. Uh, and so we're at a time where our economy has gone through this, this great recession, and, and um, we're wanting to diversify our economy. We want, to, we want to be more entrepreneurial, and we want to do it in a way that's sustainable. Mm -hmm. We don't want to just start mm -hmm. companies that you know may not have their their um, part of their bottom line may not be the community, mm -hmm. um, and so it creates all these negative what I call them externalities, pollution, and things like that. Right. And that's not sustainable. And so it's a good opportunity for companies to engage consumers in a new way and to say, look, this is how we're working in the community, and that's in turn we think is going to help to grow the bottom line of companies and create a better relationship um, with companies and um, their consumers. Because, again, we're creating what's called a shared value. And so I think consumers are now very savvy as to, you know, where they want to invest their dollars when they're buying a product mm -hmm. um, and that they want to see it go for the greater benefit and greater good. And so that's why we're seeing social entrepreneurship emerge on the scene in Charlotte. And we're seeing, you know, for-profit companies looking at their, you know, how they can do their business in a different way right. that um, adds value to everyone. Well, one question I want to just, the last one I want to pass around to everybody is, you know, a lot of times people associate people that are doing good works with not being good business people. Mm. <laughs> and I kind of want to know, do you think that these businesses are, uh, you know, in a position to succeed ultimately, or are they just kind of do-gooder? I mean, you know, it's kind of a loaded question. But, you know, what are your thoughts on, like, as far as the running of these companies, you know? Um, well, this is going to sound a little cliche, but mm. I am believe completely in, like, karma and paying it forward. And I think if you... It, first of all, it makes your brand look better mm -hmm. to be like a good business and to work on good morals and good values. But if you give and you pay that, I, it'll come back to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not maybe in popularity, mm -hmm. if not finances, but that will ultimately benefit them mm -hmm. monetarily. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So to me, it's paying it for it. But what frankly, do I know? I'm not a businesswoman. Quite <laughs> frankly, the productive ones will survive and the, uh, the non-productive ones won't. Right, and, right. Uh, that's right. part of the uh, American economic model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
But, um, just to, that, that's a great question because one of the elements of what we do is to support nonprofits and building their capacity and mm-hmm. being more innovative. Um, because there is a kind of a thought, a mindset that if you're nonprofit, that you don't necessarily know how to, you know, run a business. Right. Um, and we're seeking to by by working um, with nonprofits and for profits, we're seeking to help shift some of those stereotypes. You know, some of those stereotypes that for profits are just out to make money and they don't care about the community, mm-hmm. and that nonprofits are just do gooders, and but they don't know how to run a business. Right. And so what Queen City Forward does is we try to support both of those um, models in the sense of of helping for profits to create shared value and help nonprofits to be more efficient and more innovative in how they run their business so that it's sustainable, so that they're creating new forms of income streams. Mm-hmm. Like like I said, like King's Kitchen, which is a nonprofit restaurant. Who's right. heard of such mm-hmm. a thing? And then you go in, the food is great, and you're giving it's just it's just a great mix. Okay. Yeah. Well that's cool. Very good, man. It's uh, I'm excited about it and I hope that people visit your site. I think they're gonna probably put the website address okay. on the bottom of the That'd screen. But definitely, I definitely want people to check that out. Great. So. Thanks, Carlton. But let's move on to um, our second topic of the day, which is um, the military families in Charlotte, in North Carolina in general. Um, right now, as we know, there are lots of skirmishes going on around the globe. We're involved in some things like Afghanistan and Iraq, and we're pulling out of some of that stuff. And as we pull out of those things, then other things are popping up, like Syria uh, and incidents like that. And... One of the things that we automatically think that we thought here was what effect does that have on military families, you know, in our own backyard? And with that, what, uh, what do organizations like the USO of North Carolina do to help out those families and support them? Well, Colton, thanks for the opportunity to uh, sort of tell our story, but I, and I appreciate that uh, greatly. Um, I'm an old fighter pilot. I've been on active duty for 35 years. Uh, started off in Vietnam as a forward air controller, uh, flew fighters and air defense uh, of the Soviet Union back during the Cold War. Wow. And I will tell you that uh, today's operations tempo, which separates families from their military members, and not just male, female, I mean, males as the primary uh, military member. Now we have a number of, uh, of very talented uh, females on active duty as well. Uh, but the bottom line is because of the incredible operations tempo that's going on today, uh, these families are constantly coming and going, being separated. and. You basically, when you're away from your family, you count the number of uh, basketball games that your sons and daughters are playing in. You count the number of Christmases that you've missed. And it really takes a toll on the on the families. Mm-hmm. My last job was as commander of U.S. Forces in Japan. And so living overseas for the last 15 years of my career, I saw the uh, impact that the separation of the families had on my young uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines. And it was a constant challenge for us to continue to provide support for these uh, these young kids so they could do their jobs. Uh, when I retired, my wife and I both got uh, very involved, in fact, uh, with the USO of North Carolina. In fact, my wife is the vice president of the USO of North oh, wow. Carolina. Okay. And so I'm her number one volunteer. I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. Um, <laughs> and it's just amazing uh, for us to see how these young men and women uh, perform. And I would like to just basically describe the USO of North Carolina for just a minute. Okay. Because uh, North Carolina is the uh, is the number four state in the union for military support. In other words, we have the fourth highest number of military members living in our state, and that's just active duty. If you add the Guard and Reserves, we are the we are the most uh, committed uh, to the military in the United States. And so, as these families uh, go on to their different assignments as they move, as as uh, troops are deployed, and so on. Uh, the USO of North Carolina has filled in the void of, of taking care of these folks. In fact, we see over 407,000 military members and their family members a year in wow. the four centers that we have here in the state. And so uh, at the end of the, uh, this month, the end of March and the 31st of March, we're hosting a, a Welcome Home Vietnam Veterans event. Right now we've got over 49,000 people sign up for free tickets to do that. Oh, wow. And it's not a fundraiser. The objective is to basically recognize a generation of service members who probably haven't been recognized in the past. Mm -hmm. But it's going to be a family event. We've got Coca-Cola sponsoring uh, 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 the the kids' uh, bounce castle, and we've got um, military demonstrations. We've got uh, the uh, Charlie Daniels Band is going to be performing uh, a number of great events. And it's just a way of us saying thanks to our active duty uh, military members and their family members. And I credit that to the uh, USO North Carolina Charlotte Motor Speedway, where the venue is going to be held, and also the North Carolina Association of Broadcasters for helping us. That's uh, that's that's a really great event, um, and 
like I said, I'm sure more information will be blasted on the bottom of the screen. But, you know, I, I want to ask you one thing. Do you feel like, um, you know, speaking of Vietnam, you know, there was a time when I think the general populace of the United States was not necessarily thought of as being 100% behind the military, mm -hmm. uh, as far as actually people in the military. Um, I wonder, do you think things have changed now that we can separate, you know, U.S. state policy, government policy from the actual people that are on the ground? It has absolutely changed. In fact, uh, our youngest son had three tours in Iraq, uh, two as a, a B-1 bomber crew member and one where he actually was on the ground with the Army trying to solve the problem of the uh, improvised explosive devices, the IEDs that were killing our mm -hmm. troops uh, using electronic means to uh, pre-detonate these things. And uh, when he came back from overseas, I had tears in my eyes. And there were not tears of sorrow, there were tears of joy because, to me, the American people had finally recognized the contribution of these young great men and women of what they mm -hmm. do, and also recognize the stresses on the families as they deploy. And so right. when my wife and I retired from the Air Force, uh, we started focusing on taking care of the families. And I think that is one of the real beauties of living in the Charlotte area because Charlotte has been just absolutely incredible in That's providing cool. support, corporate support, but also participation in mm -hmm. the events. In fact, we have a volunteer list uh, here in Charlotte of the four centers, Charlotte, uh, Fort Bragg, Camp Lejeune, and uh, Raleigh Durham, uh, we have over 270 volunteers who want to wow. come and uh, help these young kids in our center. So it's really cool. Uh, it is way cool. Okay, I think Jarvis has uh, something from social media world. Yes, just um, a quick plug for the event that the general was was talking about on March 31st, the Vietnam Veterans Homecoming Celebration, and Charlotte Motor Speedway says there are fewer than 7,500 tickets remaining, so it's a free event. So you should go to. Uh, USO-NC.org quickly to reserve your spot. And on Twitter, we asked, uh, we let our uh, followers know that North Carolina is home to tens of thousands of U.S. military personnel. Do you think our troops should be involved in Syria or Iran? Uh, at Furtis 2 says, absolutely not. We don't have to let our boys die for some mad politicians. Defensive war is something else. Back to you, Carlton. All right, Jarvis. Well, um, Charles, I want to throw this to you, you know, and then we can kind of bring it around. Uh, in the news today, there was a uh, there's a military serviceman who reportedly you know went into a village and killed some innocent civilians, and we don't really know what the facts are now. They just do an investigation of it. But how hard does that really make it for the the, the people that left behind on the on the ground? Do you think? I mean, in terms of the families that are yeah, here. Yeah, in terms of the families. Well, I mean, I, mean, I just think that in, in general, as uh, the, the general was, was mentioning, it's just it's really hard for families to, to, to be separated. Um, I couldn't, uh, um, uh, I've not had to experience that personally. I've had it um, some of my um, relatives, um, but to experience that, per if I had to imagine me having to leave my family, mm -hmm. um, I've got three boys and my wife, mm -hmm. and having to go somewhere where I'm, I'm in danger mm -hmm. and I might not come back. Right. Uh, so when you have an incident that happens today, and I heard it with, with my 12-year-old son in the car, and I just shook my head because I know it makes things more complicated. Right. It makes it more dangerous for uh, our men and women that are serving over there, and then it makes it harder for our families. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you, know, I, I, you know, for me, I personally, in the field I work for towards is just to try to create as much peace as possible right. mm -hmm. so that we can all, you know, you know live together in mm -hmm. prosperity. And so, I, 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 you know. My heart goes out to, to everybody involved, right. you know, um, and just wish the best. I do want to mm -hmm. bring up the idea of PTSD. And obviously, we don't know what happened in the case that's going on right now, but there are a lot of servicemen who come back and they're dealing with PTSD. Does USO offer any, you know, service or guidance uh, for people suffering? PTSD? In fact, that's one of the uh, issues I'm most proud of because in my day in Vietnam, when someone came back with uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome um, disorder, uh, it was considered battlefield fatigue and we were just sort of put into the uh, population and allowed to sort it out ourselves. Right. Uh, nowadays, the all of the services and the Department of Defense are incredibly tuned to the issue of PTSD and also TBI, traumatic brain injury, mm. uh, because as these IEDs go off, uh, what it does to the human body is just incredible. And some of the the true uh, damage is not physical, it's, it's uh, emotional and, and, and mental. And so the uh, various programs that are going on uh, in the military, the Veterans Administration, uh, are, are very, very advanced. And the USO's role is basically to uh, help try and identify these roles and link them up with the appropriate resources to take care of these great young men and mm -hmm. women. Brittany, I want to ask you this question and then we'll move to the next topic. But 
What do you think that we can do as just like normal folks walking the street who are not really involved with stuff like USO, organizations like that? What can we do to really get involved and, and help out? military families and I mean support them appreciate them understand and recognize what they're doing whether you agree with what they're fighting for or not right. you, they're still defending you and fighting for you so you can have freedom and get up and enjoy your family right you know so just yeah. I, I think every opportunity I have to donate to veterans USO you, you got to take advantage of it that's it I feel like it's your patriotic duty mm -hmm. one thing remember is these young men and women are our sons our daughters our aunts our uncles our fathers our mothers they are us. They are drawn from their society. They represent the best of our society, and they should be remembered that they are part of our society. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, great. Well, uh, definitely, folks, check out this event coming up. Was March thirty first? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, sir. March and uh, check online to get all the information about it. Now we're going to move on to something a little lighter, just a little bit. St. <laughs> Patrick's little bit. Day. <laughs> well, depending on how much you drink. Huh? Well, so that, well that, you know, that's one thing. I was having a conversation with somebody, and we feel like there's certain holidays that really don't have a lot of significance other than drinking. You know, Cinco de Mayo, as we know, historically has no links to any independent battle or anything. St. Patrick's Day, now I'm, I'm sure there's some kind of religious something that started it is. way it's, back it's in the day. It's a religious holiday for St. Patrick. However, drinking green beer is not the thing that no. ties you to that. So anyway, but it's coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. And you being the paid to party person, the Otis show, you know the best stuff to go to. So can you tell us some cool events coming up for St. Patrick's Day? Well, there's the one event that's actually so big that the Travel Channel came and recorded it last year. Now, what is that? That would be the Rich and Bennett's Pub Crawl. It's literally, like, to the number, broken world records, the world's largest pub crawl. What? Really? Yeah, it had 9,000 <laughs> people. Here in Charlotte. Yeah, and the best is, is that... A lot of drunks in Charlotte. <laughs> no. if, if you don't like drunk shenanigans, stay away from uptown Stay away Saturday. from St. Patrick's Day if you because, don't like drunk shenanigans. Yeah, it, it starts out with the parade, uh -huh. which begins at, like, I think noon. Mm -hmm. No, 11. And then after that is the Green Festival, and it has nothing to do with recycling. By green, they mean, like, green <laughs> beer. Okay. And then the pub crawl starts at noon, and it goes... Till the end of the night. It's and got it's like all, 20 bars uptown? in Charlotte. It's all yeah. in uptown? Okay. Like every single bar in uptown will be infiltrated with Okay, so you got, the, you got the pub crawl. What else, you, what else you got for it? Well, I thought this was really cool. Uh, the Whitewater Center is getting the water completely green, you know, like the Chicago River. Mm -hmm. Can you drink the water? Yeah, they're not flooding it with toxins. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just, just like green dye. Yeah, it's just dyed okay, for. Okay. And then they're going to have a music festival and, and, of course, drinking. Drunk people should not get in a boat, right? Absol absolutely no. no yeah. white water. Don't drink in white water. Rats. Okay, so right. you got the green white water. Well, green water now. Mm -hmm. So any what what's some other good, cool stuff? Well, any Irish bar will obviously be mm -hmm. you know adhering to this holiday. Uh, there's a new one, Fitzgerald, that just opened in uptown. Okay. Rira, which is one of the oldest ones, mm -hmm. it burnt down and then was rebuilt. And PG O'Reilly's in South Charlotte, okay. and then basically any bar is going to be having drink specials. Yeah. Literally every bar will be having drink specials. Well, I, I kind of wonder, um, you know, and maybe this is sort of a, a numbery kind of question, but what effect does this have on the Uptown Bar's business? Is this sort of like Christmas for them? Is, <laughs> I mean, you know, does this kind of make their year when St. Patty's Day comes around? Um, well, there have been a lot of events that have helped the downtown economy lately, CIAA. And right. then uh, the DNC coming. So this is another one of those things where it does add to the profits of the bars, which okay. helps the economy. So thank you to all the drunks. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's got to be some other stuff going on that does not involve drinking uh, besides the whitewater rafting that is St. Patrick's Day affiliated. I mean, like, can I go get some authentic, around this time, authentic Irish food around that time? I mean... Would I just get that from Rira or something? Yeah, or the what? different Irish bars will be having the traditional fare. Okay. Um, you know, the, the corned beef and... Um, Not haggis or anything like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think haggis is Scottish anyway. Yeah, so. I don't, I'm... Okay, all right. Well, Charles and uh, General, I, I do want to know, do you guys celebrate St. Patrick's Day? Yeah. Is, is there any Queen City Forward or USO St. Patrick's Day stuff coming Depends up? Depends on the year, you know. <laughs> Will we see you downtown in your little green you shirt, bar hopping? Crawl. Might be at the parade, so we've got okay. three boys. And okay. we'll, we'll try to wear our green so we don't get We pinched. don't want to have the green teeth on, uh, on the night of uh, St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> there's evidence we had one or two drinks. Okay. okay. 
No, that's cool. Now, Brittany, uh, what else uh, can people be looking forward to? Because St. Patrick's Day is actually on Saturday, right? Mm -hmm. That's convenient. So that's really going to make it even bigger because sometimes St. Patrick's Day falls in the middle of the week, yeah, right? Yeah, there's really not much. They just kind of hold it off until the Saturday. So, mm -hmm. Are there any, so like, pre-St. Patrick's Day? Like, is there – are we celebrating from Friday – well, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, you know? I think it, was just, it just depends on, on how much you celebrate St. Patrick's Day or binge drinking in general. But the bulk of the um, celebrations and the parties will be on Saturday. Okay. Here's here's my last question for this. Do you know, do you have any hangover tips? <laughs> I do, actually. Well, let's, let, I, I figured you do. So. <laughs> <laughs> I used to write for, uh, That's right. you creative, write for creative Loafing. I've been the, the party girl, even though I get up at 5 a.m. now. But, now you um, do. <laughs> but, but, but give us your best hangover remedy. Uh, well, the first thing is to drink a bottle of water before you go to bed. No, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huge. Don't ever take Tylenol. People say that, but that does not help. Obviously, eat a greasy breakfast. But my favorite thing to do once you get past that initial, like, it's hard to get out of bed, mm -hmm. is to sweat, to go for a run and just sweat it out. Good mm -hmm. old-fashioned. And, and this doesn't make you, mm -hmm. like, pray to the porcelain god at that point. <laughs> no, you got party responsible, you know. I not mean, I'm dry saying if you're running and around and you're shaking all this, you know, old beer inside of you, mm -hmm. it's not. Just sweat it out. Sweat it out. Okay, so drink water, hydrate sweat it out, greasy breakfast. Yes. All right. Well, the greasy thank you, breakfast, Brittany. and then, you know, burn that off. Burn Wonderful. Off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got the lightning round coming up. We're going to pass this around and ask you guys what was the most unreported or underreported story of last week. Or you can even do the day if you want. Brittany, okay. what do you think? Um, mine, I'm a very big advocate for education. I'm actually a certified teacher, and the um, chairman of the school board said that uh, they were going to give teachers raises, which I think is like a huge thing because they just laid a bunch of mm -hmm. teachers off. I mean, mm -hmm. a ton of teachers off, and and I just personally feel that teachers should make more than athletes because that way children would look that's up right. to them more, and they're the real world models. So yeah, teacher raises. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> All right. good. All right, general. Uh, Van Barfoot died at the age of 92, and we see a lot about the Kardashian sisters, about what Britney Spears is up to, but uh, I will tell you, Van Barfoot was a Medal of Honor recipient in, the, in World War II. Uh, he literally uh, took apart uh, German tanks with his hands as wow. they were trying to kill his troops. Um, he became a, a great advocate for uh, Native American issues uh, mm -hmm. after he retired from the military. Um, but you don't see that uh, right. raised, and he is just one of the incredible... Uh, uh, founders of our military tradition, and, and okay. he was uh, one of 81 remaining uh, living uh, Medal of Honor recipients. Okay. Mm -hmm. Charles? On Tuesday last week, there was an event called the C20 Challenge, and mm -hmm. it was the finals for nonprofits to pitch their most innovative ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was an incredible event that was hosted by Social Venture Partners in Uptown Charlotte, and these 10 nonprofits talked to them in three minutes, pitched their ideas, and they had an opportunity to win prize money. Mm -hmm. And the room was packed out with foundations. And I hadn't experienced that kind of energy around creativity, entrepreneurship, innovation in Charlotte. Uh, I don't think ever. Okay. Um, and it set a tone for something that's going to continue for uh, years well, cool. to come. Well, thank you, guys. I appreciate you coming. Thank you, folks, for watching 282. Jarvis from Mount Kilimanjaro. Jarvis. <laughs> Join us again, <laughs> folks, next week. We've got another great show coming up. All right. Have a good one.